Thank you, Father, for the wonderful invitation we have to come boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy and grace. All provided because of the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, to provide forgiveness of sins when we will repent, which means to confess them, but also to turn away from them. And uh, so, Lord, as those who desire, above all, that your will would be done in our lives, we come this morning. We thank you for the access. We thank you so much for the privilege of being in your presence. Lord, we long to know you better. We, we Lord, as, as, even as we sung this morning, we're, we're, we're desperate, or I pray that we will be, to... To, to know who you are in not only just facts, but in experience, to, um, to Lord, have you in our lives, not just as someone we talk about, but as someone that we live with day by day. And Lord, we long for the life of Christ to be lived out through us. Lord, these are, in some ways, difficult concepts, and yet they represent all that you've given us in Christ and all that you've provided for us as a possibility. And so we pray for this. We ask that you will further open your word again today as we look at this passage where you've taught us to pray. And Lord, we now repeat together the words that you taught us to pray when you said that we should pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. And please turn with me to the 11th chapter of Luke. Kind of camped out for a while on these verses, uh, but today we will finish through verse 4 and then move on next week. But I trust that it's been uh, helpful, convicting, challenging. Uh, Most of all, I hope that it's been life-changing. It should be, as we come to the Word, nothing more important than our communication with our Father. Now, if any of you have flown lately, you know that you're familiar with a phrase called baggage fees apply, right? It didn't used to be quite so onerous, but it is now. We can't even fly internationally anymore with more than one free bag, the rest of them we had to pay for. So we had a fairly big bill going down to Guatemala and coming back uh, because of extra fees that apply. I think Southwest may be the only airline that will still give you a bag free domestically. I think they still do. It changes so fast. But as we come to this part of Jesus' model prayer, he's going to inform us that baggage fees apply in life as well as on the airlines much more important way, and we are urged to avoid them at all cost. Now, as we've looked at this prayer, we've said it consists of five simple requests, as the version that Luke gives us, model prayer that Jesus gives us. Petitions one and two relate to the Father. and This is intended to set the stage to to start us off in the right direction so that our prayers are centered on God and not on ourselves, so that our lives would be centered on God and not on ourselves. And what we learn is that prayer is about aligning me with God's will, not him with mine. So, so important to get that in our minds. And then we have three needs that relate to ourselves. The first one, give us each day our daily bread. It's the only request for a physical something in this prayer. The rest of them are all relating to spiritual needs. And so we see the balance 
Four out of five needs that are in this prayer relate to spiritual needs, not to physical. That's where God wants us to be focused as believers. This petition about our daily bread relates to all of our physical needs, but it's important to note, we're not praying for dessert here, right? We're not praying for our ease and comfort. We're praying for enough sustenance in terms of our physical daily needs to accomplish the mission that God has given us. This is a prayer that reminds us that we are in a spiritual warfare. And our prayer should be framed by the warfare type conditions. We need enough for our daily bread to get by and by extension, the physical needs to accomplish the task that God has given us to do while we're here on earth. So now we come to the last two requests, dealing with spiritual issues again at the end of the prayer. The first one, forgive us our sins. Now, that should raise a question in your mind right away. This is a prayer for believers, right? So why is there a request that our sins be forgiven? Why ask, aren't our sins forgiven if we're a believer? Why ask forgiveness for something that's already been forgiven? It's a good question, right? And, and some would say that a believer should never ask for forgiveness that it would show that we don't really believe that God has already forgiven us. For example, one writer said, suppose that you had a guy who was really a quick-tempered kind of a guy, and uh, suppose he loses his temper one time, and so he comes to the Lord and he prays, Lord, forgive me for uh, losing my temper. And he, you know, it's not an hour later, he turns around, he does it again, and he comes back to the Lord and he says, Lord, I'm, I'm so sorry, I did it again. And a voice from heaven says, did what? Was well, that the way this really works? I believe, beloved, there's, 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 there's some nuance here, so I hope you'll follow me closely, okay? But there is a need to be asking for forgiveness, even as a believer, not for all the past sins. And that's where a lot of people go as believers are still living in the past, did a lot of really awful things in the past. And it's easy to go back there and, and wallow in what was part of a life that's gone now and to keep asking forgiveness. And that's the point at which I think the Father would say, forgiveness for what? But there's another sense in which we do need to ask forgiveness. So let's, let's look at this carefully. What can we, how, how can we position this? Well, number one, let, let's, let's start with this. Every true believer is forgiven, is forgiven from the penalty of sin. Every true believer is forgiven from the penalty of sin. Every sin, past, present, future, every single sin that you've ever done or ever will do. It just happened that a couple of verses I want to use now are the exact verses we were going over today that wasn't planned. This was prepared way in advance of Jesse figuring out what verses we were going to do today, and we didn't consult. So Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have been justified. It's a judicial term. It's a courtroom term that Paul uses here. It means declared righteous. It means to be acquitted. And it's in a Greek aorist tense here, which means one-time action. We have been declared righteous once for all. If you are a true believer in Jesus Christ today, this is true of you. When did it happen? When you accepted the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, personal Lord and Savior. You were declared righteous at that point in time of every sin. And as a result, you have peace with God. God who was your worst enemy before because of his constant wrath against sin, justifiable wrath against sin. The wrath is now satisfied. You're now declared righteous. The judge has paid the penalty for your sin and you've accepted that payment and now he declares you righteous and you now have 
peace with God. And that's present tense. The verb that he uses there when he says we have, present tense, that means an ongoing, continuous action all into the future. And so one time you've been declared righteous and the result is that you have peace with God going on forever. That is a wonderful verse. If you couldn't say that today, keep working on it, okay? Get it down. We have peace with God. And then there's Romans 8, 1, right? There is therefore now no condemnation, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, no judgment. Now that's true, a continuous forever now. It's another Judicial term condemnation is there's no death sentence hanging over your head anymore. The death sentence that was hanging there from the moment you were born is gone when you invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior and you become in Christ at that point in time. Romans 8, 1. And then there's John 5, 24. John 5, 24, where Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in him who sent me, present tense. Whoever believes in him who sent me has, present tense, has, now and forevermore, has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, present tense, now and forevermore, does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life, has passed Perfect tense, meaning an action in the past that results in ongoing results in the present. So that's a lot of grammar, yeah, but it's really, really important grammar, right? We now have eternal life continuously. We're excluded from judgment and we've passed from death to life. This is great news, beloved. Believers are are forever exempt, forever exempt from judgment. We need to get this into our hearts and into our minds and it needs to become part of who we are because this is as good as it gets. In Christ, we are a new person. We have a new status. We're in a new position. We have a new life. We have a new standing at God's In God's court, this is a done deal once for all. So now we're back to the question, right? Why does Jesus say we need to pray, forgive us our sins? And the reason is because even though we are new creations in Christ, we keep on sinning, right? The sin doesn't stop. The principle of sin, which is called in the Bible by different names, but flesh is a key one, still resides and it indwells us as long as we are in this life. It's just part of who we are. It doesn't go away until the day we die or until the day that the Lord comes again. So we still sin, not as frequently, not as egregiously, not as comfortably, not as ongoingly, can't have a lifestyle of sin and in the same old thing over and over again and say, I'm in Christ. That would be something the Bible doesn't support, but sin will still be part of our life. The little slips that come. Paul says in Romans 7, 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out, for I do not know, for I do not do the good that I want but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. There's a war going on. Galatians 5 describes it as a war between the flesh, that old indwelling part, and the new indwelling part, the spirit within us. And so as a believer, this war rages, and sometimes the flesh wins. Now, when Paul sins as a believer... Is the sin judicially forgiven? Absolutely. He's already given us Romans 5.1 and Romans 8.1 and Jesus gave us John 5.24 to say that the sin is 
forgiven judicially, so, so no need to ask forgiveness, right? No, there still is a need to ask forgiveness. You say, why? Turn with me to 1 John 1. 1 John, now if you can get to Revelation, the last book in the Bible, then just back up four short books, past Jude, 3 John, 2 John, to 1 John. 1 John, 1 John 1. John is writing to believers. And John says this in 1 John 1. He says in verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Keeps on cleansing us. It's a present tense action. But he says in verse eight, but if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Keeps happening. Sin keeps recurring. So what do we do? Verse nine, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So our sins are all forgiven and yet we are to confess them. The Greek, again, just a little grammar lesson here has four ways of saying if and the way that it could be translated in verse nine is it's if and I assume this will be true. You could actually use the word since there. Since as a believer, you will, we will be confessing our sins. That's part of who we are. As a believer, we'll recognize it and we'll wanna get it right right away. If our sins are forgiven, why do we need to confess them? Because while our sins are covered judicially, beloved, sin still wrecks havoc with the joy of the family relationship. Are you with me? The sins are covered judicially. Nothing can ever bring us into the courtroom of justice before God. But as our father, boy, the, the barriers just went up, right? Right? And when we're in disobedience and when we are in rebellion, the family relationship becomes a huge issue. Sin causes us to hide from the Father. Sin causes us to live in emotional and physical trauma. Sin, sin causes us to live in defeat. Sin takes us down all kinds of roads of despair and discouragement and, 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 and a life that just seems to be spinning out of control, even as a believer. Sin takes us into the realm of God's disciplining hand in our life, sooner or later. And the thing that dissipates all of that is repentance, even as a believer, is confession of the sin. Let me try and illustrate it this way. We had, we had rules on the farm when I was a boy growing up. Special rules, special rules for little boys. One of the rules was you don't play on the haystacks, right? We had some stacks of bales, but we also had loose hay stacked. And we were not to play on that. I'm not sure whether dad was more concerned that we would get hurt or whether he didn't want the hay getting all messed up, right? But anyway, we weren't supposed to play on the hay, and we knew that. Second thing was no riding the calves. And I know what he was worried about there, which was the calves. No riding the calves. So one day my evil cousins were over and they spent the whole day. And we had a great day together, spending a lot of that time jumping in and out of the haystacks. And then we saw the calves in the barn and decided we'd play rodeo for a while with the calves. We had a great day till dad found out. <laughs> dad found out what was going on. He was not amused. Now, did I cease to be my father's son at that point? No. Just as much his son as ever. He might have wished I wasn't, I don't know. I was still his son. Did he cease to love me at that point? No. He did not cease to love me. In fact, he loved me so much that he was willing to bear the pain of causing pain in my life that would help me realize the need not just to not do those things, but to not do them because I really didn't want to do them because I didn't want to disappoint my father. How did he do that? A good hard spanking with tears in his eyes while he was doing it. 
You know, the spanking didn't hurt nearly as much as the tears in his eyes. I, I tried to tell him it was those evil cousins. He told me, no, it was the evil <laughs> in your heart. Your heart needs to repent. See, the relationship needed to be restored. There was no need for ju judicial issues here. I wasn't kicked out of the family. There was no need for that. But this repentance was for a straying family member. And that's why believers ask forgiveness. To restore the joy of the relationship with the Father. What did David say? David He's had a great sin of, of adultery in his life and of then the murder of the husband, the woman that he was with, right? And after a year's time, prophet came to him. He saw the sin for what it was and he repented. But had he ceased to be God's son in the meantime? Of course not. But I'll tell you what, the joy of the relationship wasn't there. He tells us in Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, both of them are psalms of repentance. He tells us that his, his bones were melting within him. I mean, he just, he was a, he'd been a mess the whole time. You can't sin, beloved, and not expect to be a mess. And so we confess our sin to, to see the joy of the relationship restored. Look, turn with me to... John, John chapter 13. You can get back to Luke and then just go forward one to John. John 13. Jesus gives a wonderful illustration of this. The night before he is crucified, he's with his disciples. They come into this upper room. There's no servant there to wash the feet as would be normal. None of the disciples would do that because they were busy arguing about which one of them was the greatest, if you can believe that. So Jesus stripped off his clothes down to the clothing of a servant and he got the water and he began to wash their feet. When he got to Peter, he got some flack. That's not unexpected, is it? And so we get to John 13 and verse eight. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. You're... You're the Lord, I'm the servant, I understand that. You're not gonna wash my feet, Jesus. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, well, Lord, if that's the case, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head, wash me all from top to bottom. And Jesus said to him, the one who has been bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean and you are clean. Not every one of you. That was a reference to, G to Judas, of course. But you see the point. Peter, you're a believer. You, you, you belong to me. There's going to be occasions when you sin and you need to confess your sin. You need to make it right. You need to restore the relationship with the Father through the confession of your sin. And so Jesus includes in his prayer Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our sins. Now, if you're back in Luke 11, there's a next phrase that comes after forgive us our sins. It's a really, really tough phrase. Luke 11, verse 4 Forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. So does that mean that Jesus only forgives our sins if we are forgiving others? Is that what Jesus means? Well, let me put your mind kind of at ease and then, we, then let me get back at it and take it out of ease again in just a moment. It can't mean that we're only forgiven if we forgive first. That would be salvation by works. That would deny, be contrary to much of the rest of Scripture. So it cannot mean that in the absolute sense. Forgiveness is always based on, our, on grace freely given in response to faith. That's the way of salvation, right? And that's the way of forgiveness. Frankly, if our, if our forgiveness depended on us, we'd be in sad shape right from the very beginning. 
Even at our best, we're pushing that revenge button too hard and way too often, right? But here's what it does mean, believe it, beloved. It it means this. It's It's the same message that we have that's just consistently throughout the Bible. Same message is consistently without the Bible. The Bible teaches that true faith is not produced by works, but true faith always results in works. And so what Jesus is saying here is, you're asking me to forgive you. If you really mean that, you're going to be forgiving these over here that you have a grudge against. That'll just be part of who you are. Failure to extend forgiveness to others even when it's not deserved shows that our own repentance is a charade. It's a fraud. It's not real. Because we're not willing to extend forgiveness for others. Let me, Jesus illustrates this in another passage, Matthew 18. Turn there. Matthew 18. I know this is hard because it's so easy to harbor and we've been wronged and our rights have been violated and somebody has stepped on our toes and I mean really badly stabbed us in the back. But look at this, Matthew 18, 23. Jesus gives this parable. A king decided he was gonna settle accounts, all the outstanding accounts and he found a guy that owed him $10 million. It's something else in the passage, but let's make it relevant. $10 million, the guy owes him. And it turns out the king, he can't can't pay, so the king's about to sell him and his family into slavery, which he would have had the perfect right to do in those days. But the servant begs for mercy. And so we get down to Matthew 18 and and, uh, verse... uh, Oh, let's go to verse 25. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. (laughs) Forgave him a $10 million debt. That's not the end of the parable, what what grace this man has been shown. But this servant who has been graced so turns around and it turns out there's a guy out there that owes him $100. And so he goes to collect the $100. And the guy that owes him $100 is in the same position. He just doesn't have the money. He can't pay. And so when that debtor begged for forgiveness, look at verse 30, this man refused and went and sent him to prison until he should pay the debt. Then result in verse 32, then his servant summoned him and said to him, uh, his master, I'm sorry, summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? In anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he could pay all his debt. Now the point of this parable is not that God first forgives and then withdraws forgiveness. That's not the point. The point is this, beloved, that a heart which will not forgive others was not truly repentant in the first place. We fool ourselves. Self-deceived, self-deception, we don't even see it in ourselves, but that's why, that's why the Lord gives these kind of parables. That's why these kind of stories are in the Bible, to open up our eyes to who we really are. And as we sit here this morning even and are harboring grudges and we know we are and we have it in for somebody and we're, we're, we're wishing for revenge or whatever else, what it shows is that we may truly never have been repentant to the Lord our, ourselves because we've been forgiven so much more then we would ever be asked to forgive someone else. It falls under the category of James 2. Remember how James 2 and verse 14, James says, what good is it if, brothers, if anyone says he has faith, but that faith does not have works, can that faith save him? His point is not that you're not saved by faith. His point is that you're saved by works. His point is that true faith has works. Works follow true faith, as we've seen in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10.
James isn't saying that faith results from works, but he's saying that true faith results in works. And one of those first works is the willingness to forgive those against whom we have grudges because we have been forgiven so much. You know, Martin Luther, the great champion of justification by faith, he said this one time, he says, yes, it's true. We are saved by faith alone, but not faith which remains alone. True faith results eventually in a willingness to be Christ-like. The genuineness of our repentance is shown by our willingness to forgive others. Jesus is aiming here at the self-deception that it can be right at the center of our being. Paul says in Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. We always think that what others do is worse than us. You know, what they did was so horrible. I would never do anything like that. And God said, man, I looked into your heart and forgave you way more. You owed me $100 million and you won't forgive that guy $100. You're not real. Spurgeon, commenting on this passage, said this. He said, and listen to this. Listen carefully to this. Unless you have forgiven others, You read your own death warrant when you repeat the Lord's Prayer. Whoa. Let me read that again. Unless you are willing to forgive others, you read your own death warrant when you repeat the Lord's Prayer. Pretty strong language, isn't it? But see, there's a reason why Jesus added that little phrase, forgive us our sins, even as we forgive those who are indebted to us. We have to ask ourselves if we're just burying ourselves in hypocrisy and our faith isn't really real. Someone tells his wife, you know, my love, I have sinned against God, I have sinned against you, I have stupidly been unfaithful. I realize my mistake, I confess my sin, I repent of it, I hate what I have done, I love you with all my heart and I long for you, I beg you, please, would you, can you forgive me? A couple days later, the wife comes back and she says, she says, yes, I I, I love you too, I will forgive you. But I must tell you, I have something to confess as well. Last month, I overspent our clothing budget saw a dress on sale that I just couldn't pass up and I, and I bought the dress. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I overspent the clothing budget. What possible answer could the guy give? You see, if he won't forgive her that small, insignificant by comparison, Violation. How could he ever hope that she would forgive him for the unfaithfulness that's been in his life? And that's exactly where Jesus is going in this prayer. I have forgiven you everything. You must forgive those who violate you. The Puritan John Owen said this. He said, our forgiving of others will not procure forgiveness for ourselves. But our not forgiving others proves that we ourselves are not forgiven. If you have a deep and abiding sense of who you were outside of Christ and a deep and abiding sense of all that he has forgiven you, you will willingly extend forgiveness to others, beloved. It's part of who a Christian is. Okay, the last phrase, right? Lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. We've just prayed uh, for forgiveness. Now he's gonna take us a level deeper. What would keep us from having to pray for forgiveness? That would be that we don't sin, right? And why do we sin? Because of temptation. So now the prayer is, Lord, lead us, don't even lead us into temptation. No temptation, no sin. That's the idea. But the request is kind of strangely framed, right? Lord, lead us not into temptation as though there were some possibility that the Lord might lead us into temptation. Would the Lord 
lead us into temptation to take us down? Would he, would he do that? Might he arrange for our downfall unless we ask him not to? Well, we know that wouldn't be true, right? The Lord would never do something intended to cause us to fall, to bring us down. I mean, that would violate his very character in the first place. But secondly, he promises in James 1.13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. He tempts no one. That's a promise. You have God's word on it. So this cannot be a request that God not somehow you know, be out to deep six us by some temptation that we can't get over. So what does it mean? Lead us not into temptation. Here's what I believe it means. You may remember, only if you have a really, really good memory. <laughs> when we studied Luke 4 about the temptation of Christ, we found that the word temptation there it's a form of the word peirazos, is the, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the verb peirasmos, is the, is the noun. That's the word that's used to trans, translate temptation most of the time in the New Testament. But we also found that that word has two meanings, not just one, and they're, they're, almost, they're almost equal and opposite. We, one is to tempt with the idea of causing someone to fail. And in that sense... In that sense, Satan was leading Christ into temptation. He wanted him to fail. His point was to put something in front of him that would cause him to sin. But that word peirazo can also mean to test with the idea of causing someone to grow, with the idea that someone makes the right decision. So for example, God tested Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Why? Because he, he wanted them to fail? No, with the idea that they would grow, that they would learn the thing that they wanted to get anyway, the knowledge of good and evil, but that they would get it in the right way instead of the wrong way. God specifically, we're told, tested Abraham by asking him to sacrifice his own son, which was not only a personal disaster, but would have negated all the promises that, of, that God had given that a son was gonna come through whom Abraham would become a great nation and through whom he would inherit the land that he was in. And so all of these promises related to this son and now God's saying, I want you to go out and sacrifice him. I want you to kill him. Why? Did God wanna take Abraham down? No, it was a huge test. It was intended to grow Abraham's faith. It was intended to make him better. It was intended to make him more godlike than he had ever been before. And here's the thing, beloved. Every temptation that comes into our life, you could look at it this way. It's intended as a temptation by Satan. It's intended as a test by God. It's intended by Satan to take us down. It's intended by God to raise us up and to grow us, to make us more Christ-like, to mature us, to get the, you know, the silliness out of our life and get real maturity into our life. So this word has these two choices and these little tests go on all the time, every day. The sooner you realize this, the more you'll be able to respond appropriately. You know, sometimes they're little pop quizzes and sometimes they're like, you know, the semester final. Some are small, some are big. But on God's part, they're intended for our good. So when, when Jesus says, I want you to pray, lead us not into temptation, it's a prayer that we not get in over our head. It's not a prayer that he take them away altogether, but it's a prayer that we not get in over our head, that, 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 that he lead us in such a way that, you know, it's like, it's like when you look around your life, you know, if you think about it, the distractions are everywhere, right? The things that would lead us off in the wrong path, things put there by Satan, things just because of the world, things that the flesh causes to be part of us, they're everywhere. It's, it, life is like a minefield. And this is a prayer that the Lord take us through that minefield, avoiding those for the most part. 
allowing us only to come to those that are gonna, that we can pass. Lead us not into temptation. He's saying don't cause us to go into temptation when he permits temptation in our life, that it be for the reason that we could grow in him. We're asking him to keep us away from those minefields, those mines, those buried mines that would take us down. Don't permit us to go where our desire might take us. If I hit one, you know, help me not to succumb to that temptation. You know what this is? As much as anything, this is a prayer that, 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 that the Bible often encourages us to pray for what the Bible already tells us, promises us, right? And there's a promise in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You should be aware of it. If you're not aware of it, and especially you young people, man, just, you know, this is one you should memorize. In fact, I think if you're in our class, you're gonna memorize it. So 1 Corinthians 10, 13, what does it say? It says, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you, specifically you, to be tempted above what you are able. So your neighbor may be able to handle more than you, but God's guarantee is I won't let you get in over your head. On the other hand, you may be the stronger one, and so you may find yourself getting more than your neighbor gets. But God will never put you in a position that you can't pass the test. He will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear. That's what he says, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And this prayer is basically a prayer, Lord, make that be true in my life. Lead us not into temptation. Matthew helps us a little on this because in Matthew's version of this prayer, there's a little phrase that's added, Matthew 6, 13. There Jesus says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And if you look it up, well, in the Greek, it literally says, deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from Satan. So what we're really praying is, Lord, what Satan intends as a temptation, I know you intend as a test. Please help me to pass. I'm going to get through this. It's a, prayer for, it's a prayer for God to rule our existence instead of Satan. It's, it's a, it's, if you want to think about it that way, it's a recognition that it's either one or the other. You know, this, this idea that we rule our own existence, which is, which is one of the great deceptions of Satan, is totally wrong. Jesus tells us, listen, you're either of, the, of your father, the Lord, you're of your father, the devil. It's one or the other. There's no middle ground there. You you can't be of your father yourself. You don't have that choice. So this is a prayer that God would be the ruler of our existence. I like how Kenneth Bailey, again, I think I mentioned him last time, but he had a wonderful illustration of this. He tells how you go on these trips in the Middle East, like the Sahara Desert, and he said it's very dangerous because the wind blows and what was a path today is gone tomorrow, and it... You, know, you can't tell where you're going. You have no clue. So if you're going, you, might, you, you have to carefully select who you're going to have as your guide because you are literally putting your, hand, your life into the hands of that person. And he'd been on several trips over there. He said they got to the place where they really trusted a guide whose name, well, they just called him Uncle Zaki. I'm sure he had some strange name they couldn't pronounce, so they called him Uncle Zaki. And they would come to him at the beginning of a trip and they would say, Uncle Zachy, would you please lead us? And then they would say, please, don't get us lost. In the middle of this place where we don't really know where we're going, don't get us lost. That's what Jesus is asking us to pray. Lead us not into temptation. Don't get us into a situation that we can't get out of. Don't get us lost in the desert. Don't let that happen. Fulfill your promise from 1 Corinthians 10, 13 in my life. Don't permit us to get, to get us into temptation that will destroy us, rather see us safely through. So you put these two things together and baggage fees apply. During World War 
two. There was an attack relatively early in the war, some of you will remember on Tokyo. A B-29 was one of the planes that was sent there and they lost two engines, so they had two left as they were flying out, but they had a <coughs> thousand miles to get back to their home base. And they had, with those two engines out, the likelihood that they were gonna make it was very slim, but the commander said, listen, I, I just, I've never believed in ditching a plane while it was still flying. He said, we gotta try and make it. He said, but if we're gonna make it, we gotta throw everything over, make this plane as light as possible. So they began to do that. They, flew, they, they threw food over, they flew, threw water over, ammunition, armor, equipment, everything they could find that wasn't absolutely necessary, they, they threw it overboard. They had some tenuous hours flying that thousand miles, but at the last moment, just as their last fuel was running out, they were able to land safely on Saipan. And beloved, that's, that's what this prayer is about. If we're gonna make it safely home, we gotta throw over the baggage of, un, uh, of grudges and of bitterness and of, uh, of, the, of the things that we hang on where we're, where we're, where we're, just, not, where we're just not allowing God to be the one who takes, takes vengeance, give it to him. We need to be forgiving those who, against whom we think we have grudges and we need, to be, we need to be avoiding temptation. Baggage fees apply when we don't do that. We'll pay. Eventually we will pay. So let's get our eyes on Christ and his forgiveness. Avoid the fees because he's already paid them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word Lord, I pray that we will pray as you would have us pray. With concern, much more concern for our spiritual well-being than for our material well-being. Lord, I, 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 I confess I have been guilty more than one time of praying for some physical need, for some physical want, for some physical luxury, for some physical um, desire while at the same time harboring grudges, harboring lack of forgiveness. Lord, if we, we do that enough, it would show we've really not experienced true forgiveness. Help us to examine our lives and make sure that that's not the case. That'd be the first thing. Am I, am I really of the faith, as Paul instructed us to do? Evaluate yourself to see if you're really of the faith. If we're hanging on to so hard those hard feelings towards someone, an unwillingness to forgive, not just forgive grudgingly, but enthusiastically as you have forgiven us. Wow, it would be a sign that maybe, maybe we don't belong to you. And so we need to come in repentance and Lord, accept the forgiveness that's ready and available there, but in turn, turn around and extend it to the one that owes us a hundred dollars. And then Father, that we would see every temptation not as something intended to bring us, bring us down, but intended by you to build us up. Help us to avoid those we can avoid. Help us to learn to stay away from the places and the things and the ways that we are tempted. We could we could list hundreds of those. We just need to be wise so that our prayers would have legs. Thank you, Father, for teaching us to pray. Help us to learn, be good students. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.